To all of my regular listeners, welcome back to people who feel obligated to listen to the show because they're related or they're friends or whatever. Welcome back to new people. Welcome to this season two of Admit One. I took a little break, obviously, back there in May or so. It was honestly only intended to be a small break because we were moving and stuff like that, but then shit just kept piling up, so someone suggested to me that we just break it up into a season, and I slowly came around to that idea. And so here we are in season two of Admin 1, and today we're going to be looking at Mad Max. You know, for the longest time, I was really only aware of Mad Max through that semi- homage to him a reference in raising arizona um i had seen kind of the road warrior on tv but i didn't really know that there was others and i didn't really see them all or see all of them until that movie awakening of the early 2000s so at that time it was kind of cool to go back and um you know watch that part of cinema history i guess and and now it's kind of cool to go back now that my brain retains more information and, and watch them again and just kind of see their progression towards a kind of world in decay to straight up nuclear war and desert landscapes and crazy people and monster trucks and it's also interesting especially with similar movies kind of like terminator and, and things like that where um you start off with this low budget indie and now fast forward uh 30 years later you're making 150 dollars or pfft, i wish it was 150 dollars 150 million dollar action blockbuster it's just kind of crazy how the popularity can can skyrocket and and shoot you into the stratosphere like that because i'm a firm believer in in that restrictions and filmmaking yield better results um, and this is no exception, this first one here. And like I said, the, before the post-apocalyptic setting, and the, and this one is, is straight up as indie as you can get. Like, they shot it guerrilla style. Like, they would run out into the middle of the street and wouldn't have permits and stuff like that. Uh, eventually, the police caught on and were kind of interested in what they were doing and eventually started helping them out. But the fact that they were just like... You know, we don't have a whole lot of money, but we have this great idea. Like, let's go out there and fucking make it. And considering how it was made, like, they used cracked lenses and broken cameras and all this shit. Uh, it's amazing what it looks like today in, in high def and, and stuff like that. Like, it's an amazing looking film. You don't always get that. You know, there's, like, um, which sparked a debate within myself, you know, uh, with, like, The Exorcist Three with that... Uh, quote-unquote director's cut or the director's cut of once upon a time in america where they have all this footage now but it's not great quality so they they go back and forth whereas a movie like this is 30 years old and and shot guerrilla style and stuff like that and it still looks great they did what they had to do with the budget that they had so like you have this awesome movie with minimal <laughs> uh financial backing and and it and it doesn't show i watched a movie yesterday which i think we'll have an episode here shortly of um where i'm sure they probably spent similar amount of money and it it doesn't even look uh they, they don't even compete in the same sport or the same league or whatever you know the some of the max was the only one that actually had a leather costume they all all the rest were some leather imitation like and you it doesn't even show you know just it's just restrictions like that and according to george miller the post-apocalyptic setting was not the original intent 
uh, but due to budgetary con- restrictions and not being able to afford a lot of actors, it kind of lent itself to that, which then, you know, created this franchise, obviously, going forward. It would be curious to see, like, what if budgetary restrictions weren't uh, an issue? What would the story look like? Would we still have, you know, movies being made 30 years later? Would it be such a, a cultural, uh, would it still have a cultural impact on everyone? So it would be curious to see, like, these are the kind of things that I would go investigate if I had a time machine. You know what I mean? And it's also interesting to note that when this movie was released in America initially, it was redubbed with American actors. Were they that unfamiliar with uh, Australian accent even in the 80s? I think that's kind of interesting. It's not in a different language. It's in English if you watch it in with the Australian accents, like I understand every single word they're saying. And it's it's even more interesting to note that the uh, original uncut version, I guess, with the Australian accents wasn't released until 2000 or 2002, sometime depending on what your source is. But I don't know what anything else other than uh, with the Australian accent. So I watched it with the American one, and it's, it's fucking hilarious. I wish they all all would would have done that it's just something like i wish like on the repo man uh blu-ray they have the tv edit version of it on there i love that shit um i wish they would release wacky versions of it like that like weirdly edited for tv and stuff like that of course with the original too but i just like weird things like that and, and seeing different versions of it but it was popular enough and it actually is credited with opening up Australian films to the global market and was actually the most successful independent movie until the Blair Witch Project. So it's obviously uh, super popular, so why not make a sequel? Mad Max 2, or as I've always known it, The Road Warrior, because again, American distributors felt that because of the weird things that they did with the first one people wouldn't realize that this was a sequel so they called it the road warrior but then i've always known it as the road warrior and it's also funny to me that we haven't gone back and retroactively called it mad max 2 even though when you pop the movie in it doesn't say road warrior anywhere it says mad max 2 so i'm kind of curious if people had paid to see the road warrior and then once the credits start to roll it says mad max 2 and they're like wait a minute i paid for the road warrior where what's going on here you got the wrong movie on what I liked most, and, and and what I didn't realize, uh, because growing up, this is what I associated Mad Max with, because I had no idea there was a first one for the longest time, uh, was that it depicts the world slowly falling into decay. So, like, the first one is society on the brink of collapse. You know, there's still uh, businesses around. You know, they go on vacation, and there's still police and stuff like that. But in between uh, the first and second one, there's a full-blown war, and now gas is in short supply. There's fucking weirdos running around with hockey masks, and there's little little feral kids throwing sharpened boomerangs around. So, like, it's kind of cool to see that journey, even though you don't really... It, it's just... It's a big leap, but you still kind of get it in, like, a little uh, prologue, I guess. But, the, you know, even in this one, there's still roads around and stuff. And then and then as we get into Beyond Thunderdome, that's all gone. And then, of course, with Fury Road, that's it's a distant memory. And I love one of my favorite things uh, in movies in general is like when people pay attention to continuity and not just in uh, a single movie itself. But I mean, like across several ones, like in this one, his car is the same. His costume is the same with the damage from the first. His leg is in a brace. They also kind of refer to it as guzzling. So that's kind of like Fury Road kind of harkens back to that. His eyeball is all messed up in the next one. It's I love that shit. Like someone took the time to be like, you know what? Hey, he was injured in this way. And it's not a very healable injury. So we should probably um, move it forward. So I appreciate stuff like that in movies and fury road kind of seems to take a few cues from this so it's almost like a spiritual remake even though it's a sequel kind of 
um, you know, with the people chasing the tanker truck and things like that. Um, obviously, it's a little bit different story, but and it, it gives you, you know, now that we're we've crossed this threshold, I guess Max is is who he is now. He's he's kind of turned into an opportunist, I guess. He never seeks out to do the right thing, you know. In the first one, he's kind of he's just he is trying to do the right thing. He's a cop, uh, and then his family's murdered. Spoiler alert! And then he's out to avenge that. Uh, but now he's just, he's a broken man, wandering the desert, and he's an opportunist, I think. He's always out for himself, but when the opportunity presents itself for him to be the hero, he definitely steps up. But there's always that underlying selfishness to it. Because um, he's just, now he's just roaming, roaming the land from place to place, doing whatever. And then we have Beyond Thunderdome, which is... A weird entry to me and I've always for some reason but and I guess it's not the case I was always under the impression that it's a weird sequel kind of like Godfather 3 like people just don't talk about it it's just there but it actually is a good movie and people uh, praise it it's not like this well you have to like it because it's Mad Max type of deal like like no it's a good movie and it is a good movie Tina Turner or whoever it is is odd choice but whatever she's good in it um, it's very much of its time, even though it's post-apocalyptic future, I guess. Uh, it's very 80s, um, but luckily they chop off that mullet of his. And Bruce Spence is in this. He was the uh, helicopter pilot from the Road Warrior, but now he's the uh, airplane pilot in this, I guess. That is an airplane, even though it looks weird. Uh, but he, he's a different character, still a pilot, but a different character. So that's interesting. Why not just make him the same person? I don't know. Again, I love the continuity in this and that his left eye is permanently dilated. If you notice, it's like there's a few cutaway shots, but his eye is permanently dilated um, due to the injury he received in the Road Warrior. Uh, but he doesn't have a leg brace, though, which is interesting. Maybe he's fully recovered from that. Maybe that truck crash put him back in, put it back into place. I don't know. And George Miller directed all of them, but kind of this one. He directed the action scenes, um, but unfortunately his fr a friend of his was killed uh, while location scouting for this, so that kind of put him off of it for a little bit, so they brought in another George to help direct. And um, it kind of shows. It's not glaringly obvious, but it does kind of show. But it doesn't hurt the movie at all either. And there's this weird point of contention today with fucking ratings and how they're going to affect the movie. Like, people are like, this movie better be rated R or it's not going to be any good. Especially, like, in uh, action-oriented reboots like RoboCop or Total Recall. Like, they have this weird thing, like, just because it's got an R rating on it, it's going to be fucking good. This is, a, this is a great example of that not meaning shit. This was PG-13. Uh, the first two were R. Like, ratings mean diddly squat. Whether it's action, comedy, horror, whatever. It doesn't matter. Like, what matters is the quality of the movie and the story and the acting and all this all this stuff that goes together. Your rating has diddly squat to do with it. And in this fickle landscape where, you know, you never really know what a movie's going to do anymore. Anyway, if you can appeal to the maximum amount of audience members, psh, go for it. That's, you know, you're, you're putting your millions of dollars on the line, not me, just... Make sure it's good. That's all I ask. I don't care what it's rated. If Mad Max could have been rated G if it was good. I don't give a shit. But anyway, back to the movie. Um, I'm kind of curious. Like, I, I didn't catch it if it is explained. But, you know, some of Tina Turner's baddies are dressed similar and use the same uh, style of weapons to those in the Road Warrior. So I'm wondering if that was meant to be on purpose or if they're just like... We don't really want to spend any money on costume design, or we don't can't afford it, or whatever. So I'm kind of curious. If you guys know that, let me know. That would be a 
very interesting if it was. I, w- I would prefer that, actually. You know, maybe that guy from the second one is is originally part of her deal and breaks off or whatever. Like I said earlier, it, it is a pretty good flick. But at the beginning, Max strays a little bit too far from his roots, in my opinion. Um, he's probably, at this point, you know, maybe Lethal Weapon has come out and uh, other movies that he's been in in the meantime. Um, so he's probably a bigger star right now, but so he's asking for more shit, but like his dialogue is upped a lot. And that's really not Max. You know, he's a man of few words and grunts, as Tom Hardy uh, showed you. But he's like, he's Mel Gibson in this. He's not Max. Um, but what I do like is that it's like a, a, a kind of redemptive story, you know. So um, I liked that part. Again, he's got a sweet mullet going on, but I'm glad I'm glad that the kids cut it off. It is the kids, right? Or does that happen before? Anyway, I'm glad it gets cut off. And I think at this point he had like uh, gone back to his American accent because he sounds like he's mimicking an Australian accent at this point. I really never know with the man, but... And it, one of my favorite parts of this is, you know, for these first couple, you know, they're shooting in the middle of the desert and things like that for budgetary restraints but in this one we actually get to see a big city torn apart by this uh, apocalypse uh sydney in this case you know them all the kids living in the buildings and stuff like that and passing down his story so that was kind of cool um i hope in whatever if they decide to uh, make a sequel to Fury Road. There's talk of it, and everyone will say, oh, they're going to. Well, yeah, I'll believe it when I believe it. It would be cool to kind of see another big city, even though uh, everything looks as a desert wasteland as it absolutely could be in Fury Road, but that would be cool. But speaking of Fury Road, 30 years later, we get a sequel. It's not something I was really uh, looking forward to, per se, um, like I remember seeing a setup for it at San Diego Comic Con in like 2012. It had like props and posters and shit like that, which made the movie look way different. Like it was almost washed out in this stuff that I remember. But it just goes to show you how long this movie was being made for. You know, I'm seeing shit for it in 2012 or so. Could have been 2013. I doubt it though. It was either 2012 or 2012. Whatever. The point is, this movie was being shot in 2012, and it wasn't released in 2015. That's a long time uh, for a big-budget movie like this to kind of sit out there. But, spoiler alert, it paid off. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I didn't like it at first. I saw the trailers, and I was super excited for it. But then when we got in there, it just it didn't click with me. My girlfriend loved it, but I just it didn't click. And... I think it was maybe Black Friday of that year, maybe the next year. No, it had to have been that year. Yeah. It was uh, that year, Black Friday of that year. They had Mad Max. I was like, you know what? I'll get it. It'll be for her. Uh, We put it on and watched it. And, like, I could not stop thinking about it after that. Uh, I'll I'll put it on, like, like, oh, what are we going to watch? I don't know. We'll throw on fucking Mad Max. It's just... It's uh, it's simple yet deep, and uh, the action's great. Uh, the characters are great. Uh, the story's great. It it goes back to its roots, like it's back to the quiet Mad Max and his knee brace and being in the wrong place at the right time, and he's forced into it more or less. But he does the right thing eventually. He like he is an opportunist because he's there to steal that truck because he doesn't know what's going on. But uh, to, for all he cares that these people are just wackadoos and they're just trying out there to kill each other. But but once he's in that position, he's in it to win it. He's not running away. He's there to make sure that these ladies get out of here safe. So I've seen different things over the internet. I feel like this is kind of a sequel while also at the same time being a reboot. But is it more one than the other? Because uh, I kind of feel like uh, they ignore the events of Beyond Thunderdome a little bit. Maybe this happens before. 
I guess there's some weird comic that kind of explains it. I don't really care for that. To me, the movies are canon um, in, in this instance. I don't know. You tell me. What do you think? Is this a sequel or is it a reboot? Neither? Both? I don't know. It, I guess what I'm reading here, I guess it was rumored that the sequel, uh, this movie, Mad Max Fury Road, takes place after Thunderdome. However, in Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, Max is about 40, and in Fury Road, he's in his mid-30s. He still has the car, which he loses in Beyond Thunderdome, and it's, but it's outfitted differently. I don't know. It is what, I think it's like, a, to me, it, it follows Beyond Thunderdome, just for simplicity's sake. That's what it does for me. You know what it does, though? It reminds me, do you, ever, do you remember that show, Reboot? It was like, it was the first computer, fully computer animated television show from the early 90s, followed closely by Beast Wars. Um, there was an episode where they're in the game, Bob and Enzo are in the game, and it is very reminiscent of this story where, it, and it was supposed to be the Mad Max ripoff, I think, but they're they're driving this huge thing through the desert while... The, the little binomes are chasing them. I just, I'm kind of, it's a little bit too coincidental for those things to be so similar uh, and years apart. Clearly, it probably is, but like, I think it's, uh, you know, I think that episode was probably doing an imitation of the Road Warrior. And like I said earlier, I think Fury Road is a little bit of a spiritual spiritual i can't say that word remake of uh the road warrior so kind of takes those ideas and expands on them so they're mm, probably not too far off in in their similarities there. it's kind of disappointing that there's not enough uh or more of that monster truck in this i love monster trucks why isn't there a dramatic monster truck movie riddle me that hollywood but i do think i really do think it was a missed opportunity and maybe it was done on purpose to kind of make it a fleeting moment like it didn't matter that they passed through the green place but i felt like they should have spent more time in, in what used to be the green place you know where the crows were uh and speaking of crows did you notice that throughout the entire series that whenever bad shit's about to happen you hear crow noises pay attention to that they literally just pass through the green place and don't pay um much attention to it like they're not they're they're trying to get the truck out the whole time so like there there isn't a, a time to kind of um stop and set up for the audience you know the importance of the green place it's just they show up at the power tower is that a word that's what popped in my head anyway uh you know where the the ladies are and they're like you pass through the green place and she's like no uh, it to me like as an audience member and wanting to feel something about that green place and connect with her I, di I didn't feel that that was there but when they're at that place I love how they shot the night scene normally I fucking hate when they shoot day for night and then they put that lame blue filter over it but what they did here was they like overexposed it um, which really brought an eeriness to it in fact, the whole scene is awesome. By not showing what Max is doing when he goes after that, uh, now he's eyeless, but the guy driving the tank and he's got all the guns, uh, it makes your imagination run wild. And then he shows back up with blood on him. Like, what the fuck did he just go through? I love that scene. That Even though, like, in the, uh, in the story as a whole, like I said, it bothers me that they don't, set that up a little bit better I, I love that entire scene that's probably one of my favorite scenes in the movie so a year later now we're in 2016 there's rumors running rampant that there's a black and white version of fury road and i'm like black and white who the what the fuck every time i'm reading about this movie it the director's saying that he wanted like color and he wanted people to take the film cells and and take color needles and inject not really but you know what i mean like he wanted a lot of fucking color in this 
And now we're going to get a black... I thought it was fucking dumb. A black and white version of a, a very bright film. Personally, I think it was misrepresented uh, out in the community as a whole. And I will tell you why. Because every time I'm reading about it, they're saying like, Ah, oh, this is the definitive... Definitive... Did I say it? Definitive version of Mad Max Fury Road... But then you listen to like the introduction of Black and Chrome, and he's saying that that he only got the idea because he saw a black and white working copy of the Road Warrior, I believe, in black and white. So he thought that it'd be cool to do a version of that one day. Uh, Road Warrior might have worked because it's kind of a, it's not, it's an interesting looking film, but it's not driven by its color where this is. So I love how in the introduction he says that it looks cool. But there's some scenes that work better in color, which is very true. Uh, but never once does he mention that it's the definitive uh, edition that some reported. It was more of an experiment. And I, I that's cool. I dig that. Yeah, cool. Try shit like that. You know, Logan War or whatever. That was cool to see. Some things just don't. I'm, I'm waiting for a Guardians of the Galaxy in black and white. It's... It, with this trend going on, I don't know. If you shoot it in black and white, and you have the intention of doing that, that's great. But uh, otherwise, just maybe leave it alone. I don't know. That's my thinking. How long before the rest of them are converted? You know, the, the rest of the Mad Maxes. I'm sure you can find them online. While I, I, you know, this movie works better in color, there are some scenes, don't get me wrong, there are some scenes that... Where I'm watching it in black and white and I notice things that I didn't notice before. Uh, like when Max is at the very beginning when he's running through the tunnel from the War Boys and he jumps out. I noticed people working at the top of the pillars there. Which I don't, I didn't really see in the color version. And when Nux crashes the car in the uh, dirt storm, Max flops around. I never noticed that before. So more details, you know, uh, physical details popped out more. Um, like the scars and, and cracked skin of the war boy stand out more. Uh, Joe's mask definitely stands out more. But again, it's just, I don't know, it's interesting. It is interesting to watch a movie heralded for its color in black and white. You know, if it was some rando on the fucking internet doing this, I'd be like, get out of here. But the director sitting down and actually saying, look, look this is what we did. We, we had to recolor everything and do this and that. That's kind of cool to watch, I, you know. I, I dig stuff like that, different versions. There are stuff that it, it suffers because it's in black and white. Uh, the dust storm pops less, but it looks more realistic in black and white. So I'll say that. It's more violent. The landscape seems more apocalyptic. To me, in this, you know, I, I said that the nighttime scene in the green place was my favorite. In this, it looks even better. Um, it almost makes it feel like a horror movie. So, like, there's definite give and take on this. Um, it's a weird experience to kind of go through where you're saying, yeah, that works, but that doesn't. It's something that you should probably check out. Even if you don't buy it or love it or whatever, just for just to check it out for solidarity. Is that the right word? I don't know. Because you can. Because it's there. Because the filmmaker was like, dude, you guys should check this out. It may not be great, but here, check it out. And don't rush out to buy it either. If you don't already own it, it's not a must-have. It's a beautifully colorful movie, and it should be watched that way. So if you have the Blu-ray, you should be fine with that. But if you are a movie fan, again, it's worth checking out. But that is the end of our first episode of Season 2. I, that comes after one, right? One, two, Yeah, Season 2. Until uh, yeah. next time, though, that is a wrap. Brown, like we were too close to Mr. Shit. Are you the police? No, we're musicians. I work for Kaiser Soda. That's what this way no homie! I work for Kaiser Soda. That's what this way no homie! Where's the fucking money, shit? Yeah.